Good morning. I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily video update for September 14th, 2022. While there's a media frenzy over the Ukraine counteroffensive, which is reaching a fevered pitch, there are other things in the world going on that are related to the conflict in Ukraine, but have a much broader and deeper implication for the rest of the world, namely the consolidation of moves toward a new financial system outside of the existing unipolar order. Now, while you're watching this media frenzy, keep in mind there's a reason for it, an intent to this kind of coverage. First, to justify the continued flow of arms and financial aid and stepped up NATO support for Ukraine in this ongoing conflict. Secondly, to build up support for the Ukrainian dictatorship by saying, look, they're winning, they can win, and so on. Third, to escalate the regime change drive in Moscow to try and remove Putin because Putin is so instrumental for this opposition to the World Economic Forum uh, policy of a financial regime change. And fourth, to provide a cover for the destruction of Western economies and collapse of living standards by saying basically, you're doing this for the greater good. You're helping Ukrainian freedom and sovereignty. So just shut up and endure it. Now, the, the real cause of this, the, especially the collapse of living standards, is the policies of the Western nations around the Green New Deal and the Great Reset. And if you look at the EU policies, they're blaming Putin for what they're doing to their populations, uh, reducing consumption of energy and food, putting restrictions on the amount of electricity you can use, no hot showers, reduce the heat to 66 degrees in public buildings, uh, no heat in public restrooms, no hot water in public restrooms, and so on. Meanwhile, they're shutting down the most advanced agricultural economies, including the Netherlands and Germany and the United States, all in the name of reducing carbon dioxide emissions. Now, further, they have a completely incompetent approach to inflation. First, remember, they said inflation is transitory, it won't be lasting, it won't have much of an effect. Well, clearly they were wrong. The same people who were wrong are the ones whose policies created the inflation, namely the refusal to put bankrupt corporations through bankruptcy reorganization, the refusal to crack down on speculation, and then the decision to pump huge volumes of liquidity into moribund and bankrupt companies to sustain the value the inflated value of financial instruments that were created as part of this whole financialization policy of the neoliberal system. Now, the approach to it now is to raise interest rates, which is going to have an across-the-board negative effect. It may ultimately reduce inflation, but it will do so by collapsing consumption. Why not shut down the speculative system? For example, the Amsterdam Energy Trading Exchange, it just required $1.5 trillion in bailout funds to cover margin calls. And while they're providing $1.5 trillion to energy companies and the trading firms that engage in the derivatives of the, trading, uh, the energy companies, they're calling on consumers to give up a, a healthy life, give up hot water, give up heat, give up eating, and so on. Now, the key to this is that this is the European Union policy, which is self-inflicted, and their solutions will not work. And we're seeing demonstrations all over Europe. This weekend in Austria, there'll be demonstrations. There was a demonstration in Prague last weekend. Now, meanwhile, in the so-called democracies, if you protest the monarchy in the United Kingdom today, you can be hauled in and arrested for disturbing public order. So you know, we're dealing with massive hypocrisy and the hypocrisy is oriented toward protecting a dying system by preventing an alternative from emerging. 
It's not going to work, as we've seen in recent events. Last weekend, you had the Eastern Economic Forum in Vladivostok, where plans were laid out for vast expansion of uh, integration of economies, of uh, connection through rail, uh, development of new power systems, advancing trade, and a discussion which continues on moving away from the dollar to regional currencies for trade and, and investment. This week, there's the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting that's going to take place in Uzbe Uzbekistan. And going into this, the Russian spokesman for Putin, Peskov, said that the foundations of the unipolar world are creaking and wobbling. And he stated, a new reality is emerging. And there's no doubt that this is true. We see more countries moving to engage in this new economic system, which is emerging, while getting out from under the austerity regimes imposed by the global banks and the International Monetary Fund. There'll be a meeting of Presidents Putin and Xi Jinping in the next days to move ahead with the consolidation of plans that were made in February 4th when they met prior to the launching of the special military operation in Ukraine. The BRICS are moving ahead. The BRICS are becoming the BRICS Plus, with uh, Argentina applying for membership, a number of other countries looking into it, uh, including Indonesia, Egypt, Algeria. There's a potential for many of the countries of the so-called Global South, and by Global South, what I mean is the nations that were involved in the non-aligned movement in the 50s and 60s, which have been uh, the victim of neo-colonial financial policies, as described by Perkins in his book, The Economic Hitmen, how the IMF has worked together with banks to restrict credit for investment in physical goods production, and instead the looting of raw material and cheap labor from poorer countries. But what are the BRICS, the SCO? What is this whole Eurasian integration plan based on? Well, it's developing more international transportation, trade, the use of regional currencies, and investment in physical economy. So while Western banks and financial institutions are struggling to figure out how to protect the bloated and values of worthless financial instruments through flows of funny money, while denying investment in, in real economy, they're trying to figure out how to roll over growing volumes of worthless debt. And one of their means of doing that is to impose austerity on governments and on private sector investment. This is the opposite of what should be done. And I'll refer back to the importance of Lyndon LaRouche as the leading economist in the last 50 years. What LaRouche always emphasized is economics is about physical goods production based on increasing the productivity of labor by advancing science and technology, education, living standards, the increase of energy flux density, which cheapens the overall cost of production. That's what productivity gains are. They're not based on slave labor. You may get marginal increases through slave labor, but it's not sustainable. The way you increase the total value of the productive processes of an economy is escalate the scientific and, and technological developments, their applications to productive processes, and bringing in an increasingly powerful workforce to take these new technologies and increase their productivity. That When you do that, credit is not inflationary. Credit in those policies, in, in those directions, adds to the overall value of goods produced. Whereas credit going to cover bad debt only increases the debt, devalues currencies, and forces governments, or governments are forced, I should say, by global financial institutions to slash their expenditures in healthcare, in security, and so on. So we have a policy in the Western world which goes absolutely against the best traditions in the Western world which were based on the American system, which has been advanced by the work of Lyndon LaRouche. We just had a, a day of celebration 
last week of what would have been LaRouche's 100th birthday, in which many of his speeches were posted on the SchillerInstitute.com website, where he went through this question of, of what is physical economy. I'd urge you to go to that. Don't submit to this idea that somehow austerity and government policies that are designed to protect bankrupt institutions, don't submit to the idea that that's going to solve the problem. Or don't simply say they're too powerful, we can't change it. Change is taking place. That's why I talked about this Eurasian integration perspective, which could be expanded into all of Western and Eastern Europe and could be, should be enhanced by the joining of the United States with this policy, instead of launching warfare against the leading nations involved in this, namely Russia and China. So that's the fight that we have to wage. And I would encourage you to study the ideas of LaRouche because he's the economist who not only forecast the crisis over 50 years ago, but kept offering solutions based on his approach to physical economy. I'll see you again tomorrow.